Conservative Book Club members, thank you for listening to our weekly author interview podcast series. I'm Chris Mallow, GC Editor-in-Chief of the Conservative Book Club with six, over 625,000 members now across the country. Today, our exclusive author interview is with the brilliant Stephen Moore, the co-author of the newly released book, Fueling Freedom, Exposing the Mad War on Energy, published by Regnery. The book provides myth-busting myth evidence that the green energy movement is a hoax and how oil, natural gas, and coal have the power to unleash an economic revival in America. If you're not familiar with Stephen Moore or haven't seen him voluminously on Fox News, he is the Distinguished Visiting Fellow in the Project for Economic Growth at the Heritage Foundation and is the former senior economics writer for the Wall Street Journal. His most recent book was co-authored with the legendary Arthur Laffer and is titled An Inquiry into the Nature and Causes of the Wealth of States. But his current book is also co-authored by Kathleen Hartnett White, who is of the Texas Public Policy Foundation. The book is already getting accolades from some very notable figures, including Steve Hayward, uh, the Reagan scholar, T. Boone Pickens, and even Steve Forbes, with him saying, Stephen Moore exposes the fossilized thinking of opponents of, a f of fossil fuels. And we at the Conservative Book Club can't wait to share it with you all. Steve, thank you for joining us today at the Conservative Book Club, and congratulations on your new book, Fueling Freedom. Hi, Chris. Thanks so much for doing this. Appreciate your kind words. Well, we're happy to have you. Uh, tell us about your new book and why you decided to write it. Well, I think this might be the most important economic issue uh, of our times right now. Um, we have a capacity to become the energy-dominant country in the world. That has huge impact for our economy, obviously. It could be millions of new jobs, and these are, by the way, high-paying union jobs that pay 60, 80, sometimes over $100,000 for truckers and welders and pipe fitters and construction workers and engineers. So it's a huge, the energy industry is huge for our economy. I believe that if we had a pro-America energy strategy that we could, um, and by the way, that strategy is simply to keep the government out of the way and let the industry do its thing. Um, I believe we could raise our uh, our economic output by one percentage point a year. Now, that may not seem that large, but, you know, we've been growing at less than 2% under Obama. What I'm saying is we could add an extra point. We could go from 2 to 3% just through energy, and then you do some of the other things like you know, repeal Obamacare and tax reform, and you can get up to 4%. We can have real prosperity in this country. So it's a huge issue, and I just mentioned one other quick thing, that the national security implications of America becoming energy independent, which we can do in the next five years through the shale oil and gas revolution by using our coal and other resources, um, that would mean that we would be much less reliant, obviously, on foreign oil. And we know that that money is going to terrorists and it's going to ISIS and groups that are trying to kill us. So wouldn't it be a wonderful thing if rather than buying stuff from them that we were actually uh, selling our energy to, uh, to our allies? Oh, it's an excellent point. You make many throughout the book. And one of the points I love it, and you were alluding to is that we're, America is basically sitting on approximately $50 trillion yeah. worth of energy reserves in the country. Um, you, you say that the U.S. can become ener energy independent. What are the greatest impediments for us doing so? Uh, let's see. I think there's two or three of them. One would be Barack Obama. A second one would be Hillary Clinton. And maybe the third would be um, the Sierra Club. I mean, the, the left has declared war against American energy, and, and they're serious, and they're unfortunately very effective. I mean, you see heartbreakingly, in my opinion, what has happened to our coal industry. Uh, this The demise of our coal industry has nothing to do with the productivity of our industry. It was not creative destruction uh, that was created by mar the marketplace. It was government policy that uh, went right for the jugular of our coal miners and our coal plants and our utilities and has put um, many, many of our major coal companies out of business and put millions, not millions, but tens of thousands of uh, American coal miners in unemployment lines. So it's a, it's um, the regulations, the EPA, have have strangled that industry. Now they're going to go after, you see what they're going to now do, go after fracking, which is a procedure mm -hmm. that has allowed us to become energy dominant. Um, they're going to go after, you know, um, oil. They're going to go after all sorts of uh, means of energy. They've already, you know, restricted 
and, and, and regulated almost out of business our nuclear industry. And so um, I think it's the, the answer to your question, Chris, is we've got to just get government out of the way, let the private sector decide, you know, what is the most economically efficient form of energy to use. And in some cases, that's going to be nuclear power. In some places, it'll be oil. In some places, it'll be uh gas and some places be coal and in some very limited areas it might be wind and solar power but um, let's stop subsidizing energy and let's stop um, restricting it and see how the market works its way out well let's talk about fracking for a minute here i think this is something we hear a lot about but Many people don't exactly understand what it is. Uh, yeah, I only laugh when you said that because I was giving a speech recently and all these college kids were, ah, no fracking, and they were booing when I was talking, and I was talking yeah. about the energy revolution. And finally, I just stopped and I said, well, okay, kids, be quiet for a minute. I said, How many of you in this room really know what fracking is? And, you know, um, we know it's the F word, but <laughs> yeah. we, don't know, we don't know anything. They don't know what they're talking about. And that's because the, the media and the environmental groups have, have demonized this procedure and by the way, uh, fracking has been going on literally for since we drilled the first wells in Texas. And what they used to do 100 years ago is they just drop dynamite down a down a you know a well and blow it up, and then they get the oil. And yeah. now we're now we're much more refined in the way we do this. We're able to with. Uh, well, can you walk pin- us, Stephen? Can you walk us through what exactly is fracking? So fracking is a procedure where I mean it's amazing stuff. I mean the technology here is incredible. And so, and by the way, it's not as if God uh, overnight endowed us with all this oil and gas. It's been there for hundreds of thousands, if not millions of years. It's just we finally figured out a way to crack the code to get at it. And so what we're doing now, our, our wildcatters and our uh, oil companies, they're able to drill now two miles deep in the ground. That's pretty amazing, isn't it? Two miles deep. Yeah. And then they, uh, one, for one, uh, excuse me, one technology that doesn't get nearly enough publicity is called horizontal drilling. So now they go two miles deep and then they can go like a spider web in any direction. That's very new. And most of the rest of the world hasn't figured that out yet. And it means you can get at a lot of areas of uh, oil and gas that they, they weren't able to get at before. And then once they reach the edge of the shale rock, again, two miles deep in the ground, they're able to emit water and chemicals and sand into that rock formation and keep pelting it. And finally, they're able to crack through. And once they crack through, the oil and gas seeps out and we're able to bring it to the top. And it's an amazing technology. Um, anybody who's against fracking, it's like being against a cure for cancer. I mean, this is one of the biggest breakthroughs, uh, scientific breakthroughs we've seen in in many, many, many years in energy development. Well, is it now when they they'll always respond, the 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 other side will say, "Well, it harms the environment." Yep. Is there any truth in that at all? Um, look, I mean, you, if we're going to do drilling, we obviously have to do it in a very safe and effective way. We want clean air and we want clean water, and we're not going to sacrifice that for sure. And so, you know, you have to obviously have reasonable regulations. And if, if, if there is any spillage or anything like that, then the company should pay for the damage they do. There's no question about that. Um, but there was a recent um, report by Obama's own EPA, his own Environmental Protection Agency, that said there have been no instances of water contamination from fracking anywhere. So where do these stories come from, Chris? I mean, it's mm-hmm. like they've made this stuff up. Um, it, you know, the, what you need is casing on the on the on the pipes to make sure there is no leakage of this stuff because the, the 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 rigs go down. You know, the most water aquifers are only a few thousand, you know, a hundred or a few thousand feet above ground level. We're talking about going way below the aquifers, you know, a mile deeper than that, and getting at the oil and gas. And my feeling is like if we have the technology to do this, which we do, we can figure out a way to do this that's safe for the environment, that keeps our water clean and our air clean. Well, it's what you were alluding to before, I think, is an amazing point as well. What would a world look like if, if America did not have to rely on OPEC, the Middle East, and Russia for energy? Would we be involved so much over in the Middle East and that part of the world? Probably not. And, you know, it's it's just interesting because now the left's line on us, their response to our book is basically to do exactly the opposite. If you may have heard this, but, you know, Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama and the Sierra Club and the, you know, very left-wing environmental groups, their late, latest line on energy is keep it in the ground. 
even though we have 500 years worth of coal and 300 years worth of oil and natural gas, they say keep it on the ground. Now, can you imagine, Chris, if 40 or 50 years ago Saudi Arabia said, yeah, we have more oil than anybody else. Maybe we should just keep it in the ground. <laughs> I mean, how stupid would that have been? I mean, but this is, again, I think people have to open up their eyes to what we're up against. I, I bet there are some people listening to the show who are, who are contributors to the Sierra Club because we all want a clean environment. But if you're funding the Sierra Club, you're funding the enemy of economic development and sound environment policy because it's run by crazy people who, and you know, it's interesting I tell this story in the book, Chris, about, um, you know, the opening chapters about how a few years ago, I think it was two summers ago, we had a huge storm that came through um, the southeast and it wiped out the power, you know, the uh, in the more household and the more home for about three days, we didn't have electric power. And I tell the story about my kids, my teenage kids, you know, they after about 12 hours, they went crazy. Without ele- How did people live with electric power? They couldn't power up their, you know, Game Boys and their <laughs> iPads and their iPhones. You know, so these millennials who think it's so wonderful to go green, uh, my kids had a first-hand exposure of what it's going to be like if we if we have brownouts and blackouts. And by the way, we will. If we let the environmentalists, Chris, run our energy policy, and their policy, they are basically saying go 100% renewable energy. Uh, that is the craziest thing I've ever heard. You are going to have blackouts and brownouts. What are you going to do when the sun isn't shining? What are you going to do when the wind isn't blowing? Where are we going to get our energy? You know. So um, this is a scary proposition when we fool with our energy supply. And what we're saying in our book is let's let's make sure we have the most reliable, the cheapest, and, and made in America energy to become uh, economically dominant in the world. I mean, in other words, what we're saying, Chris, to put it very simply, is the United States can be the new Saudi Arabia for the rest of the century. Well, what do you think? I mean, just lastly, um, you know, you always hear th- throughout the Obama administration, the Paris agreements, you know, conservatives have been called climate skeptics or anti-science. And, you know, you allude to the radical leftists and what they want to do with the environment. And sure, part of it is, pre- you know, you want to have a clean mm-hmm. environment, no doubt. But what do you think, what is the, the greater motivation here at play? Why is it, are they so relentless in the, I would call their anti-science uh, with the, the green energy movement and, the, you know, as you mentioned in your book, less than 3%, I think, comes from solar, wind, uh, and wind power where we get our energy. Um, what, what do you think is, is undergirding this, this ener- green energy movement? Um, I think it's been one of the greatest propaganda campaigns in, in American history. Um, you know, I think that, the, look, scientists are very much in disagreement about this. There's no scientific consensus. Some scientists say it's a real problem, and some, a lot of them say that, uh, you know, look, the weather patterns on the planet have changed for millions of years. And, you know, it's, there's a bit it's of an arrogance. Weather. Yeah. You know, there's a bit of an arrogance to think that government can change the weather. I mean, really? Yeah. Uh, they can't even balance the budget. They can't deliver the mail, but they're going to change the weather. Um, <laughs> I, look, I guess my point would be a couple of things. Let's. I, I am not one who believes climate change is a great catastrophe. I just don't believe it. But many people do, so let's give them the benefit of the doubt and say that this is a real crisis. I would make a couple of points. First of all, shutting down American energy is no way to deal with that crisis. I mean, we're, so we've shut down probably 50 or 100 coal plants in this country over the last three or four years to try to reduce carbon emissions. While we're doing that, China and India are building hundreds of coal plants. So, Chris, tell me how is that going to reduce carbon emissions? If we're shutting ours down, but they're building 10 for every one we shut down. The rest of the world is going to move forward with their energy. Why would we unilaterally economically disarm ourselves, number one? Number two, look, if this is a crisis, it's not going to be dealt with through government mandates and regulations. It's going to be dealt with through new technologies that that help us change the way the, the weather patterns work. And all sorts of new technologies are going to probably come about in the next 50 years to give us the know-how to do that. What we need then is economic advance. The more technologically sophisticated we get, the better able we're to we're able to deal with crises, whether they're earthquakes or, you know, changing weather patterns and so on. Um, so my point is growth and technological development, not government, are the best solutions to those kinds of potential natural disasters. Well, Steve, it's a, it's a great book and uh, really enjoyed reading it. And thank you for all that you do and, and taking the time to talk with us today. We wish you all the best of luck with the, with the book. 
So thank you, and thanks for what you guys do, and really pointing people to the you know most important conservative books. Because you go to the bookstore, and all you see is liberal trash. And <laughs> it's nice that people can see books that uh, educate people on the free markets and freedom and the Constitution. And you guys do that every week. So thank you. Well, we appreciate that, Steve. Thank you, CBC members. Make sure to check out conservativebookclub.com to learn more about Steve Moore and his new book, Fueling Freedom. Thank you again, Stephen. Okay. Thank you. All right. Take care.